Hey guys, what's up? I'm back here with day 37. This is our final related rate video. Um, covering all sorts of, all right, over these few days of related rates, covering all sorts of different types of problems. Now on the test, you may see one that you've never seen before, right? And that's okay. You know the skills, how to set it up, how to solve them. So let's take a look. Um, if you want to just go ahead and pause the video quick and copy down this question. Okay. Uh, here's what it says. Some, sometimes we see related rate problems that don't really have any context to it, um, but we can still solve. So it says, first off, positive variables M and P are changing with respect to time. The equation that relates them is M squared equals 6 minus P quantity cubed. At the instant P equals 2 and dm dt is 10, find dp dt. Okay? So... Again, we don't have any real-world context to this problem, but it's still a related rate problem because we have two, two different variables changing at different rates. Okay, so again, what we want to do here is go ahead and make a known and need column. This should be pretty easy. It's, it's pretty laid out for us, but it's still a good idea to write them down. So here's what we know. Um, well, we know P equals 2. We know dm dt is 10. And, we're, and that's really all we know. What we need then is dp dt. Okay. So the no is laid out nicely. The need is pretty obvious. The equation should be obvious here too. Our equation is, again, always make sure you write this as an equation, not an expression. Our equation is m squared equals 6 minus p cubed. So the first part of this problem is pretty simple here. And we'll see what happens as we keep going. Um, the left side of the equation is pretty easy to derive. The derivative of m squared would then be 2m dm dt. And don't forget to tack on your dm dt there. Uh, on the right side, I'm going to have to do a, a chain rule problem. Because I see uh, a function, 6 minus p, within another function, p cubed. So, chain rule is I do the derivative of the outside with respect to the inside. times the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative of the inside will be, well, the derivative of 6 is 0. The derivative of negative p is negative 1. But I need to tack on my dp dt. So my derivative comes out something like that. OK? And I need dp dt. All right, looking through this equation here, I have P, so that's not a problem. I have dm dt, but I don't know m. Okay, so we've run into this problem before, and we just used our equation from the beginning to solve it. So let's use that beginning equation and see if we can find out m at that instant. So again, here's what I know. I know P is equal to 2. So in my equation, m squared equals 6 minus p cubed. I'm just going to plug in 2 for p. And I'm going to have 6 minus 2 cubed equals m squared. 6 minus 2 is 4, and 4 cubed, 4 times 4 is 16, times 4 is 64. And now you might say, well, hold on, this is going to give two solutions. Couldn't m be either 8 or negative 8? Which one should I use? Well, if we go back to the prompt here, if I can do that. If we go back to the prompt here, it says positive variables m and p. So that means m has to equal positive 8, not negative 8. So I know m equals 8. Now I can go solve the rest of this. So I've got 2 times 8 times the MDT, which is 10. 
equals 3 times 6 minus 2 squared times negative 1, oops, negative 1, not negative 1, dPvt. Now I can just crank this thing out and solve it. 2 times 8 is 16. 16 times 10 is 160. 6 minus 2 is 4. 4 squared is 16. 16 times 3 is 48. And times negative 1, I'm just going to make that a negative 48 dPvt. I'm going to go ahead and divide them, and I'm going to get dPvt. equals 160, negative 160 over 48. These things both divide by 8. 16 divided by 8 is 2, so 160 divided by 2 is negative 20. 48 divided by 8 is 6, and I can do one more, negative 10 over 3. So I get dpdt to be negative 10 over 3. There were no units given in this problem, so you don't need to worry about the units for it. And there we have it. Okay. Let's take a look at another. I have two more problems to look at. Let's look at our second problem. So here's what it says. A five foot tall. Again, you can pause it and copy this down. Here's what it says. A five foot tall person is walking away from a 20 foot light pole at a rate of six feet per second at night. What is the rate of change of the person's shadow length? Okay. So the first time I ever came across a problem like this, I felt like we were missing too much information. Okay. So let's get a sketch of what's going on. Remembering that when we label our sketches, it's important Things that are going to be varying, label as variables. Things that are going to be constant, label as numbers, constants, right? So first off, let's think about the 20-foot light pole. Is the light, pole, is the light pole's height going to be changing? Well, the answer is most definitely no. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and put in my 20-foot light pole. I'm not going to call it L or P or anything like that. I'm going to call it 20. I'm never going to give that a variable because it's not varying. Okay, so there's my light pole. And I also have a five foot tall person. People don't grow at, people don't change their height at a fast enough pace for that to, uh, to be changing in this problem. So I'm going to put my five foot tall person out here. And I'm just going to call it five. Okay? And here's what we have. This light pole up here is going to be shining and casting a shadow, right? So the person over here is going to be casting a shadow. I'll use black for the shadow of the person. Okay. So that is going to create a shadow right there. And as this person is moving, that shadow is going to be changing. So I want to name the shadow some kind of variable. I'm going to choose the shadow variable to be, I don't want to use S and 5 because they look too similar. I'll use X for my shadow. Okay. So what, what you need to see here is what we have is Two overlapping triangles form. As this person is walking away, right? This person is walking this way. These two triangles are both going to be changing. But the 20 and 5 won't ever be changing because the person's not going to get taller or shorter. Neither is the light pole. Okay? But that distance between... The person in the light pole, that will be changing as the person moves. So I need to give that a variable. I'm going to give it the variable W. Okay. 
So in my picture here, I have to come up with two different variables for the two parts of the face of that big triangle. The only thing that I have in my no column is I know that the person is walking away from the light pole at a rate of six feet per second. So that person is moving away from the light pole at a, at a rate of six feet per second. So my question for you then is what's going to be in our no column? Okay. And I want to think about it in relationship to the variables that I've already assigned here. Okay. So again, if you follow my cursor here, as this person move, this person is moving away at six feet per second, the light pole is stationary. So what that means is this variable right here, which I chose to be W for walking, okay, the rate of change of this variable right here will be a positive six. I know it has to be a positive six because W is going to be getting bigger at six feet per second. If the person was walking towards the light pole at six feet per second, then W would be DW DT would be negative six. Again, that six feet per second is most definitely a rate. So in my no column here, I need to correctly identify that six as equal to W W D T. And what I want to know is the rate of change of the length of the shadow. Well, the shadow is X. So what I need then is the rate of change of the shadow. So my need is going to be dx dt. Okay. Now, when you do these problems, you don't have to use the same variables that I do. Okay. But our rate of change of our shadow is, in this case, dx dt. Whereas our walking speed is dw dt. Okay, again, I don't know w and I don't know x. And the cool thing is, you never need to know those to solve this problem. Okay. What we have to do here, okay, is we have to see that these two triangles are similar. We have to come up with an equation. Now, you might be thinking Pythagorean theorem, okay, but because this aspect of the triangle, Right, the hypotenuse of the triangle is never known nor cared about. I I can't use the Pythagorean theorem here effectively to solve this. What I'm going to use is the fact that is that these two triangles are similar to each other. That's where our equation is going to come from. So similar triangles are another way to set up another equation that we can get. And when we do similar triangles, if we remember back to um, geometry. We know that similar triangles have proportional sides. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write an equation that's just a proportion of the, the sides here. Okay, But I need to do this very carefully. I need to make sure I'm lining up corresponding parts. So what I like to do is I'm going to go from big to small. So I'm going to do big height over small height. And so my equation is going to start off with the big height, which is 20, over the person height, which is 5. So I'm doing 20 over 5. Height of triangle over height of triangle, big over small. Now I need to do base of triangle, base of big triangle, over base of little triangle. But well, what you need to understand here is W is not the base of the big triangle. The base of the big triangle is these two combined. It's that total distance, W and X here. So I need my big triangle base to be W plus X. And I'm going to do that over my little triangle base, which is X. That's the equation that I can set up. Okay, so again, I'm just setting up similar triangles. Corresponding side over corresponding side equals corresponding side over corresponding side. I just need you to see that on the big triangle there, 
That base isn't W, it's W plus X. Okay, so the next thing I, I want to do, I need to do a derivative. Now, the way this is set up right now, it is not going to be friendly for a derivative because I'd have to do a quotient rule with that W plus X over X. I don't want to do that, and in fact, I can't solve it that way because I'm going to have to know W and X to do it that way. So all I'm going to do is think about, well, when we set up our proportions like this in, in geometry, the first thing we did was we cross-multiplied. If we cross-multiply here, we're going to be able to get a much simpler equation to, to derive. So watch what happens. I'm just going to go ahead and cross-multiply this thing. I'm going to get 5 times W plus X equals 20X. I'm going to go ahead and distribute this, and I'm going to get 5W plus 5X equals 20X. The last thing I'm going to do, just to make it even more simple, is get the X's together. I'm going to subtract 5X from this guy. I'm going to get 5W equals 15X. Now, this is a much easier qu equation to derive. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and do the derivative and watch how easy it is. What's the derivative of 5w? Well, the derivative of 5w is 5 dw dt. What's the derivative of 15x? Well, that's 15 dx dt. And because this was linear, the W and the X are going to drop out, so I never needed to know them in the first place. Now I can just go back to my no column. The only thing in my no column is DW dg equals 6. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. So I get 30 equals 15 dx dt. So the x dt equals 2 feet per second. And that is how fast that shadow is changing. So again, we had to use similar triangles to write an equation. We use cross multiplication to make it into a simpler equation, then derived it and got our answer. Okay. It can be a pretty tricky problem, but once you kind of understand how to set it up, um, and the tricks of it, it ends up being actually a pretty easy problem. Okay, last question is a doozy. Okay, but let's take a look at it. Here's what we got. Once again, just go ahead and pause the video right now and write down this question. Okay, here's what it says. A cylindrical cone with vertex pointed down is being filled with water at a rate of five cubic feet per minute. The cone has a radius of 10 feet and a height of 20 feet. What is the rate of change of the height of the water when the height of the water is four feet? So we've got a couple of things going on here that are really, really important to understand, okay? Really, it's like we have two cones here. We have the solid cone that's being filled with water, and then we have like the water cone that's forming inside. So let's just get a sketch of what's going on here. So here is my big column. I draw a cone by drawing a V and then a very thin ellipse. Okay. And that cone itself is never changing. So a lot of one of the mistakes people make on this problem is they'll say r equals 10 and h equals 20. Okay. I don't I know the radius of the big cone is 10, but that big cone is never changing. So I'm not going to call that r. The water cone that's going to be forming inside will be changing. That's where I'm going to use r and h. So because this cone that's being filled, vertex pointed down. The radius of this cone is 10. So 
I am just going to write in 10 there. But notice I never, I didn't call it R because it's unchanging throughout this problem. Okay. The other thing I know is that the height of this cone is 20, and that won't change throughout this problem either. So I'm not going to say H equals 20. I'm just going to label the picture as 20. Now, this cone is being filled with water. And obviously, the water is going to take on the shape of a cone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little water in this thing. Okay. Now, as I'm adding water to this tank, the blue cone, the water cone, will be changing. So the radius of the water cone, that's the one I'm going to label R. And the height of the water cone, that's the one I'm going to label H. Okay? We saw a problem like this in our homework a while ago. Okay? So the same, same kind of thing here. Because the water is what's actually changing here, that's that cone I'm going to have a radius and a height for. By the way, they would give you a, an equation here. The equation that they would give you is this. The volume of a cone is equal to a third pi r squared h. That's the equation that they'll give you. Okay. So what I want to do now is go to my no column. Here's my no cone. And again, resist the urge to call R10 and H20, because those are not varying. That cone is always going to have a radius of 10 and always have a height of 20. What I do want to do is look back at the very beginning. Water is being filled. Says a car is being filled with water at a rate of five cubic feet per minute. Okay, this is going to go in my no cone. Looking at this cubic unit here, it's pretty obvious that this is dvdt. Okay, so that's going to go in as my dvdt. I know it's a positive five because we're filling the cone, not draining the cone. Okay, then it says, what is the rate of change of the height of the water? Okay, the height of the water we're calling H. So what I need is dH dt. When the water has a height of four feet. When the water height is four feet, that's another thing I know. It's not a rate, it's just H equals four. So again, my no here is the immediate is 5 and H is 4. My need is DHDT. Okay, my equation should be pretty obvious too. Because it's the only one I have. And it's volume equals one third pi r squared H. Now again, when I first saw this problem, I immediately went to the derivative. I'm going to do this in red because it's, we're not going to end up doing it this way. But here was the thought process when I first saw this. Like, okay, I'm going to do the derivative. I'm going to have a product rule here. The first term is going to be a third pi r squared. The second term is going to be h. So I'm going to get dv dt equals. I'll do the derivative of the first. The derivative of one third pi r squared is two thirds pi r dr dt h. That's the derivative of the first times the second plus the first, a third pi r squared times the derivative of the second, which is dh dt. So dh dt popped out, which is what I need, but there's a big problem here. There's way too many unknowns. I don't know dh dt, which is okay, but I also don't know r or dr dt. 
So this isn't going to work very well. Okay? There's too many unknowns. So I'm going to put an X through this. And the method that I'm going to use to solve this one is I'm going to use substitution. And what I'm going to, the way I'm going to make this substitution is very similar to the last problem. I'm going to use similar triangles to make a substitution. If I could get that R and the RDT out of there, then I could just have a volume equation solely in terms of H. The way I make this substitution is by looking at two similar triangles. Okay? Here's what I want you to look at. I want you to look at this triangle and this triangle. Okay? I'll sketch them over here really quick. This is 10. This whole thing is 20. Okay. But I also have H and R. And again, I have these overlapping similar triangles. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write an equation based on the proportionality of those sides. And I'm going to substitute that equation into my volume equation. And I'm going to be able to do my derivative only in terms of H. H is what I want because I need the H dt. So let's write an equation based on these two things, right? I'm just going to go proportional side to proportional side. So I'm going to start off by doing big triangle to little triangle. So I'm going to do 10 over R. Equals so this side over this side equals this whole side, which is, is 20 divided by this whole side, which is H. So I'm going to say equals 20 over H. Just like before, what I want to do is cross multiply. Cross multiply here. When I do that, I get um, 20R equals 10H. And here's what I want to do. I want my equation to only be in, ter in terms of H which means I want to solve this equation for the other variable r. So I'm going to solve this equation for r, and I'm going to substitute that into my equation so I can get a volume equation solely in, charge of, solely in terms of h. So here's what I do. I'm going to divide both sides by 20. I'm going to get r equals 1 half h. Okay, 10h over 20 reduces to half h. What I'm going to do now is go back to my volume equation. Okay, I'm going to rewrite my volume equation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject this half h in for r. Remembering that it's still being squared. So making that substitution... I have a volume equation that is only in terms of H. Obviously, this is a really tough problem here. Okay? But again, if something like this came up on the AP exam and you can get it right, that's going to differentiate you. All right, I'm going to simplify this thing down before I do the derivative. What's half H squared simplified to? Well, that literally means half H times half H. That will be one-fourth H squared. H. So I'm going to combine these two. One third times one fourth is one twelfth. That's multiplication. One twelfth pi. I'm going to combine these two. H squared times H is H cubed. And I got a much simpler derivative to do. Okay, so now I'm going to derive. I'm going to get the VDT equals, I don't need a product rule anymore because I'm down to a single variable. I'm going to multiply that 3 out front. 3 times 1 twelfth is 3 twelfths, which is 1 fourth pi h squared dh dt. Right? The problem from here on out is easy. Going in for db dt is 5. 
going in for h is 4, still being squared. 4 squared is 16. 16 times the fourth is 4. So I get 5 equals 4 pi dh dt. And I get the rate of change of the height to be 5 over 4 pi feet per, what was it, minute, I think? Feet per minute. A pretty brutal problem. You may see one a challenge problem like this on our test on Friday. All right, guys, that's it for today. Uh, kind of a long video, but an important one. We'll get ready to review tomorrow and Thursday to get to test on Friday. Talk to you guys later. Two chains. Bye.